Welcome. My name is Samantha Grant, and on behalf of the Children, Youth, and Families at Risk Professional Development and Technical Assistance Center, thank you for joining our webinar today. We are pleased to have two of our very own doctors. Autumn Kano Guin and Philip L. Ely as our presenters today. Before we begin, there are a few administrative announcements I would like to make. A recording of today's webinar will be posted on the CIFAR PDTA Center's website at cifar.org. During the presentation, you can discuss topics in the chat box at any point. However, questions for the presenters should be placed in the Q&A box as depicted on the screen. At the conclusion of the webinar, a pop-up window will open asking you to participate in a short survey. Please click continue and complete our brief online survey to share feedback on today's presentation, as well as any suggestions for future webinar topics. And now it is my pleasure to present today's speakers. Dr. Adam Kano Guin supports program implementation, evaluation, and sustainability for CIFAR sustainable community projects across the country as a CIFAR PDTA center coach. In addition, she is an adjunct assistant professor in the Youth, Family, and Community Science graduate program and the Quality Youth Program Specialist for North Carolina 4-H. In these roles, Autumn co-directs multiple grant programs and provides leadership in developing, implementing, overseeing, evaluating, and sustaining research-based and evidence-informed programs for youth, families, and community. Autumn holds a PhD in educational research and policy analysis, specializing in educational evaluation and educator professional development an MS in Community Psychology, and a BS in Psychology. In addition, she's a board-certified coach with 25 years of qualitative and quantitative research and evaluation experience. Dr. Philip Ely serves as the coaching coordinator for the CIFAR PDTA Center. He also serves on the 4-H Access, Equity, and Belonging Committee, as well as the 4-H Thrive Model Curriculum Committee. Philip earned a PhD where his research focused on developing and promoting underrepresented populations to executive level leadership and masters in organizational development from Penn State. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in communications from West Virginia State University. Philip is a retired Army officer with an, with an extensive leadership, mentoring, teaching, and coaching background. He holds the Master's Practitioner designation from the International Association of Coaching. I will turn it over to Autumn and Philip. Thank you, Sam. And welcome to everyone. Uh, thank you for being with us. Um, uh, we, we encourage you all to participate by uh, putting stuff in the chat. Uh, we'll, we'll continue to try to look back and forth. So please, if you got questions, if you got things you want to add, um, feel free to try to be as engaged as possible. Um, today, we're gonna, I'm going to take you real quick through our roadmap. We're going to start with CIFAR's role in sustainability. Then we're going to talk a little bit about what the PSAT is, um, how grantees scored on the PSAT, and then we're going to uh, talk about how we can use those PSAT results to really help us um, to, to move the needle towards being sustainable uh, within our programs. So to start us off, you know, why, why are we talking about sustainability? So the real question is, what are some of the, what are the three essential program components that's required of CIFAR? So one, um, again, within its name, sus sustainable community program is community. The other one is technology. And you'll see that um, because when you look at the RFP, it specifically states that each, pro each project should have a technology person. But then the one we're going to really talk about today is sustainability. And again, that's in the name. It's sustainable community programs. And you can see all this on the site for our philosophy. Um, it's on page four. So when we think about sustainability, when you think about programs who don't have a, a technical assistance support, after initial funding ends, they usually go away. 
those programs usually are not sustainable. So my first question to each one of you all is, what, what do you all see as some of the biggest barriers to sustainability? So go ahead in the chat um, box, go ahead and start talking about or, or put in some of the biggest uh, things that you see as barriers to sustainability. And I see Danae put something in. So I just uh, think we changed it. So try to see if you can chat in the chat box now. So we'll give everybody just the, another couple of minutes to put in their answers. Okay, support from universities, changing leadership, turnover, funding, funding, staffing, funding, staff changes, unwillingness of staff support, Technical support needs, commitment, okay. Care, awesome. So yeah, some th those are some of some big reasons why programs aren't being sustained. So when we look at CIFAR programs, however, we see a little bit of a difference. We see that 75% of CIFAR programs continue after NIFA funding. Now, first of all, we got to talk a little bit about what continue means, because being sustainable doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to do exactly the same thing that you did when you had CIFAR grant funding. So it may be certain components of your uh, grant that you continue to, to move forward. It may be um, that you do it exactly the way it was when you, when you had CIFAR grant funding. So it could look a very different, but if you're continuing to do it, then it's being sustained. And that's what we're looking for. That's what we're trying to get to is being sustained. So if we have such high success rate, then why is that? And it really comes down to this. CIFAR grants receive a lot of support from the CIFAR PDTA Center. And that's not us just tooting our own horn, but that's the reason why the CIFAR PDTA Center exists because it shows research shows that when you have technical assistance and support that there's a higher likelihood that uh, programming will continue and so and that's why that we have the CIFAR PDTA center program so let's look a little bit about what that looks like so of course some of our technical assistance is coaching it's the emails the evaluation consults when we look at professional development, we look at the webinars that are provided um, like this one. We also look at um, other things like our professional development event that we have. And again, next year, uh, it's gonna be in Minnesota. So some shameless plugs. But today we're gonna really focus on one of the, our tools and resources that we have, which is this program sustainability assessment tool. So, Back in the day for some of our older grants, we used to do what was called the sustainability spider web. And we only did that in year three of the grant and it had 14 dimensions and we, when we got people involved, but we said, we're, we're not really taking full advantage of, of a tool that we can be using to help the sustainability, to help answer some of the things that we put down in that chat box. So, we're moving to this program sustainability and assessment tool. So we did one year of it so far and it's working. We can see it and we can use it. So what the program sustainability assessment tool or the PSAT, we're gonna do it every year and it has only eight dimensions. And by doing it every year, it can give us rich data that can help us, again, going back to why we have the PDTA Center, help us provide support and provide um, things that coaches can use to help you be sustainable post CIFAR funding. Because again, that's what this is all about, being sustainable post CIFAR funding. 
So the last piece that, that we did, these are the results. And as you can see, uh, I think we did pretty good. Most of them were at five or higher, at five points or higher. We have a couple that were low. And again, one of our biggest concerns and one of the things that was mentioned in the chat was this funding uh, stability. And then another thing that was kind of low was the strategic planning. So we're going to dig into each one of these categories and actually talk about, one, what the results kind of said, but two, how we can use these results to really help um, grantees and not just grantees, but CIFAR program as a whole do better, starting with this environmental support. So I'm going to turn it over to Autumn. Thanks, Philip, and thanks for that great overview. Um, I'm excited to talk about this because I've been able to use it with all of my sites this past year, and they'll recognize um, a little bit of the spider web and the wording and some of the things on these slides because it has really provided a way for us to have conversations around the different factors that build sustainability in programs. And I want to point out for environmental support, we are looking at a score of 5.51 from all of the CIFAR grantees who reported to this. So this is not a state. This is the whole system of CIFAR folks reporting in. And that's out of a scale of six. And so relatively speaking, that's a high score. But even our, I think, 3.37, maybe our lowest, was it 3.97, is our lowest score on this. And so that tells me overall that our sites are keyed into sustainability and really doing a great job. And so having these conversations regularly, that moving to once a year with coaches is, is going to kick it up just a notch. And so for environmental support, things like whether you have champions who support your program, champions who have access to resources, leadership, support from the larger organization. And these are some of the things that we saw that people were reporting in as challenges in the chat earlier. If the program has leadership support from outside of the organization, that was in this particular component, the lowest scoring among all of the factors. And that's why we're bolding some things as we go. Um, and then of course the program having strong public support. And so the strong public support part of this is those community partners who get to know about your program and become your cheerleaders. So what kinds of support do your programs have, and please answer me in the chat, from outside of your organization? The school district is a very important partner, Elizabeth. I see that. We have that as well in North Carolina. We have support from our schools who are going to help us with the STEM project that we have that we're moving into our second year on. Teachers, schools, school systems, space, staff, transportation from outside partners. Those are all great examples and factors that help us to sustain. All right. Mm -hmm. All right, school district and youth programs. So folks like YMCA and Boys and Girls Clubs and some others are partners that I know exist outside of our land grant and extension spaces who are great partners. I don't know, Philip, you got anything to add to this one before we move on? So I, I think everyone kind of summed it up um in the chat this is one of those things that is important and again you'll see this as we go through each one of these categories these are all things that are tied to sustainability so while you might not think having support from um leadership or outside people are important they are very important because it's going to help uh drive the train so uh, again everyone likes to be part of a winning team so if you're doing well within your programming and you have the support and they're part of that team, it's going to make it easier for you to sustain post CIFAR funding. Okay. 
So let so this one funding sustainability. Hmm, I can talk today, really, y'all. Funding stability was relatively lower than all of the other scores on this measure, and realistically, we're a grant program, so I'm not surprised because what I have seen in the time that I have been in, a, in extension is a lot of times programs will try to sustain themselves on grant funds over and over and over again, rather than getting out into the community and seeking out different types of sources. And so <laughs> it's important for the program to exist in a supportive state economic climate or national economic climate. And as we've seen, a lot of prices have gone up for us across the board since COVID. We were talking about travel dollars earlier and how they're just not stretching as far as they were. And so having a program in a supportive economic climate is important. Um, having a program that implements policies to ensure sustained funding. And so seeking out funding, having the ability to seek funding, have the, having those partnerships within the university to seek funding, because there are, at least for me, some funding I can seek out, but some funding that I have to involve leadership and our um, foundations people in to be able. So knowing what all of those policy and rule things are that you have to follow, um, having a variety of sources of funding and having a combination of stable as well as flexible funding. So things like um, some of the, oh gosh, what are they called? The, the six accounts in my world, where you have people who have given into a bucket that hangs out forever, a longevity kind of plan, as well as having some grant funds in place. The lowest among the this factor was having funding from a variety of sources. Um, and realistically, if you think about how many of our folks are um, in fourth and fifth year of, of grant funding, um, this is really the time to think about what are those different sources that we can th get funding from. And so what are some ways that you have been able to seek out funding? There we go. Volunteer donated time and community supply donations. Yes, Nancy. And I did see earlier when we were talking about things like space and in kind from schools. Yes, Jody. What else? Foundation grants and program fees. This is the first year that I have learned that I can charge um, like registration for things. I mean, I've been to all these conferences and I've done all this work forever. But charging registration for people to come and be part of a program and then being able to have that paid by outside entities or some other sources, because obviously we're not charging our participants to participate, but registration fees and things like that. Um, extension funds, yes. Small amounts from foundations. The extension director supports our program. I love that, Yebin. So it's really important. And your coach somewhere has a sustainability PowerPoint to talk about all of the different types of funding sources that exist in the world. And Philip, not to put you on the spot, but I know you probably have that on speed dial somewhere in your world. Oh, absolutely. And and when we talk about that, we're we're looking at four main categories. Um, um, and you know, like are they uh, funds like we had mentioned, like in kind funds, in kind donations? You know, are we? Uh, so that's what we would call share. You know, are they sharing resources that help reduce those expenses? Um, are they funds that um, 
where we're charging. So some of the things that we've talked about, the registration fees, things like that, or how we charge for it. Um, so those just different types of ways that we can generate or bring in money and diversify um, our, our funding stream. Any other thoughts from the audience on funding stability, stability and ways to come up with additional funding sources? One thing that I'll add is, um, and I guess I should have said when I had a spotlight. So <laughs> the last, you know, part of that is that earning piece. Um, one of the, one of our grants um, that we had before, um, they they did, they were working on our gardening and working on uh, food prep and putting together food. And they had a lot of immigrant families that were in the program. So one of the things that they did was they made a, a cookbook. Um and they they sold that cookbook. So they earned money that way. So by selling their cookbook of different recipes that their families have put together. And so there's a lot of different ways that that we can go out and, and use funding. And one of the other things is this is directly tied back into the category we were just talking about. So if leadership is supportive and if outside leadership is supportive of, of what you're doing in your program, then they will tend to release some funds that they have at their disposal to help uh, to help you to have this flexible, this stable, and a variety of sources of funding. Well, and I'd put in the chat, Philip, charging for a curriculum or for a program training. I am blessed in North Carolina that I have a team that works with me to build curriculum and build programs and to do it well. Um, I know that's not true of every land grant of every spot, but one of the things we do is we give our curriculum to our 4-H agents for free. But if you're outside of the state, we charge not a whole lot, but we charge for our curriculum. And that's a way to maintain some programming, but also for us to go back in and be able to fix it as the research changes and as things need to be adapted. And so that's one way that we are able to bring in, it's not much y'all, not everybody's rushing to buy 4-H curriculum from North Carolina State, but it, I mean, it, it helps a little bit. So partnerships. Partnerships are critical. I was having this conversation earlier. Um, the grant that I have in North Carolina is with our sister institution, our NCANT 1890 and NC State have a CIFAR grant. And that partnership is critical to everything that we do. And so having your diverse community organizations invested in the success of your program, having real buy-in, not just lip service to a program, um, the program communicating with leaders in the community and doing it in a way that is meaningful for those leaders, um, having community leaders who are involved in the program, having community members who are passionately, I love that item, passionately committed to the program. Um, that makes a significant difference in the sustainability of a program. And that can be one human who, takes on and spearheads efforts to make sure that this program happens. And depending on who that human is, if they are one of the gatekeepers in the community, that can be it. Like the program is going to continue. And the community is engaged in the development of program goals. And I see Yabian put partnership support. We once received children's books to give out to our families from the library district. They had extra money to support. That's phenomenal. And so what was our low item? The community is engaged in the development of program goals. So this is that participant piece. When you can have the community bought in, but have them feel like they've been a part of the creation, a part of making meaning for the program, that becomes really important. And it's something that 
perhaps we don't do well because we are geared to build our programs or to hopefully select a program that is evidence-informed research-based to start with. And so we don't always take the time to do our needs assessment well or have conversations with our communities ahead of time. What are some ways that you guys who are here with us um, have engaged your community in the development of your program goals or your program? And Philip, do we have the ability for other folks to like raise their hand and speak in this format? Yes, you should be able to raise your hand um, and then we should be able to give uh, talking permissions to those that, that have things they want to share. I see listening sessions. Presentations, discussions, and an advisory group. Nancy, I love having an advisory group at the center of programming. That is something that we try to do with everything we do in North Carolina, too. Dan says we use needs assessment data to develop programming, but also are connected through local coalitions, which contributed to development. That's awesome. Katie says focus groups. There's a lot of cool ways to involve people, even if you've already built your program, having focus groups, um, having um, just different ways to capture community voices about the program or engage them in making it better um, and improving the program is really important in helping them feel like they're a part of it and getting people to buy in. Community engagement workshops. I like that, Matilda open to the public. Anything else, Philip? I know you get to talk to all of the coaches, so you get to hear all of the great stories of what's happening across the system. It, and this is, again, it shows, and it, it's not actually shocking to me, because this is something that we've seen uh, across the board with, with a lot of programs um, that they see the request for proposal, they put it together, um, they come up with great ideas, and they go out and try to, and I don't want to say force feed a program to a community, but they present it to a community, and the community is like, well, I don't know if this is exactly what we want. Um, and that's another reason why I love the SciFi grant program, because we have that first year to really take what we thought we were going to do and really go do all these things that we put into um, in the chat to go out and talk and do the community engagement workshops, to do the focus groups, to ask the community, hey, here's what we're seeing. Are we right? Are we wrong? And, and by doing that, again, it creates that buy-in. And again, it ties right back to that first about getting the leadership from outside of our organization that's bought in which will help with that funding, which will help with the diversity of the funding and where fundings come from. All right, seeing no more comments coming in. Let's, organizational capacity. Man, we have a lot of capacity in extension. Um, I'm not sure we always leverage it well. And some of that outside partnerships makes me think about the ways that we don't always get out of our own silos and think about what's happening around us and, and talking to other folks. Um, but the flip side to that is making sure that we're talking to our folks. We're making sure that we are talking to the people who are in our organization about our program. And there have been times when I haven't done that well. I haven't informed the leadership well about programs that I'm doing and it shows in the programs. And so having a program that's integrated into the operations of the organization is important. And I do think for the most part, we do that well across extension, but I keep hearing that we are the best kept secret. And I think some of that is because we're not really good at tooting our own horn and, and talking about the things that we're doing. And so having organizational systems that support program needs, having leadership that can articulate the vision of the program to outside partners. And if we're not communicating well with our leaders, then that's an issue. You know, that's one of the places where coaches come in. 
I'll talk about that in a second, finish going through the items. But that's one of the things I'm passionate about is letting people know that they can use me when I go and visit to get in front of leaders, because I think that's an important function of a coach. Um, leadership efficiently manages staff and other resources, and the program has adequate staff to complete the program's goals. And what's our having the program well integrated into the operations of the organization was the lowest rated item on this particular scale. Um, and honestly, I'm not surprised. It's, we, I think in CIFAR specifically, do a really good job of getting into the site that we're gonna work in and working with our partners in the site and working on that outward focus. But, we're not always good at telling our leaders what's happening in our space because we do get a little bit focused on what we're doing. I don't know. Does that ring true for anybody else? How do you communicate what you're doing with your leaders? And I'm thinking like deans and extension leaders and maybe your state program leaders, like the adultier adults I don't the lead the higher level leaders in the system one pager impact reports yes something sleek something quick that tells the story and gives them maybe a link to something more if they want it what else you got Annual reports up the chain. Yes. Ongoing communications, emails, phone calls, etc. Yes. Invite them to your programs. Absolutely. And even better if you have media come into your program. I've noticed that if I have a, a newspaper or a TV station or a something that's, you know, going to really broadcast, then some leaders might show up. Teacher comments and student surveys. Those are a lot of great ideas, y'all. What you got, Philip? So I'll just say, when we look at um, sustainability, being integrated into existing systems is very important. Um, so being integrated as one of the programs that Extension says, yes, this is what we're going to put our money towards is important. And we can see it in programs like Kuntos, you know, where it started, where it is now within the North Carolina system. Uh, programs like um, New Futures out in, in Missouri, um, where it started, where it is now within their system. as It's part of the, the, the programs that, that extension says, hey, these are, are on our list of programs that we provide. So it's well integrated into the system. And all extension agents know about those programs. They know how to implement them. They know where to go. That is key. And, and, we'll, and it's the reoccurring theme that we'll see throughout this whole webinar of everything is tied to each other. So if it's well integrated, then that means that you have leadership support. And if it's integrated into the system, that means you have a stable funding stream for it. So all these things are integrated with each other. And if we're doing all these things well, that's part of the reason why we, we can see sustain uh, success and sustainability within our programming. We all love to talk about program evaluation. And as an evaluator, when I enter a space, I usually introduce myself as a program storyteller anymore instead of as an evaluator, just because you feel the temperature in the room change a little bit when you're the evaluation people. But having the capacity for quality program evaluation is critical to success because that becomes those reports. That becomes those one pagers. When you collect data well, that becomes the center for everything else that you get to report up the chain to leadership or out to the community. And so having quality evaluation, having 
program reporting both short-term and intermediate outcomes because those short-term things are going to get you a quicker story than the intermediate and the long-term outcomes are. Um, and honestly, most of the time, the long-term outcomes, the things that we're really hoping to get to, like we want more kids to graduate or we want more families to be successful, those are a little bit further down the road from some of the things that we're teaching in the right now but that's the plan. And so we don't always get to see that payout very quickly. And so having those short-term outcomes is important. Evaluation report results that inform program planning and implementation, not just outcomes. Um, program evaluation results that demonstrate success to funders and other key stakeholders. What that means is you need to know what's important to those funders and other key stakeholders when you're thinking about designing the evaluation, because that's important to include here. And the program provides strong evidence to the public that the program works. Because why do we want to fund something or why do we want to support something if it's not showing success? So that last one was the lowest scoring among all of the folks who answered this. And I don't know about you, Philip, but I'm not surprised. Like we're not good at getting that message necessarily out publicly that this program is working. We get it to our public, like the immediate, here's our group of people who we're working with, but like the broader group, the broader community, the broader public doesn't always get to hear about what's happening in some of our SIFAR programming. I don't know, what are some ways that you guys share your program evaluation work. Infographics. Impact stories. Success stories. social media, community events, pictures, results after a year of participation in pictures, absolutely. So those are a lot of great things. And one of the things that I wanna highlight, and I know our next um, slide is on product, pro program adaptation. And so we're going to make a little bit of a switch, but after that, we're going to talk about communications. That idea that we use infographics or we use pictures, I think is really critical, especially in the space that we're at now where we are sharing more by the internet, by social media, by different channels like that, really being able to have things polished and just make it look appealing um, is important and having staff on board who can help with that, I think in this space for us is also really important. I am blessed that I have a communications person who I work with, um, who is also my technology person on my SIFAR grant, who's able to do some of that work. Now, some of the data science stuff and the fancier stuff that we're starting to see, I think is important to think about too in the different spaces that we're in. Philip. So this is one of the things and one of the ways that we use this PSAT is we can see across the board, this is something that we need some work on. So now this is something that I work with the coaches on and say, hey, coaches, you know, how are we talking to the sites? How are we working with sites to think through how to do this? And not just how to provide a story to somebody, but also who are we targeting with these stories? Who are we sharing these stories with? Who are some of the key shareholders that need to hear this story? Because if we're not reaching the right people or if we're reaching people that's already supporting us, then we're not growing or expanding it. So it's it's not only just providing this strong evidence, not only providing these stories, but really thinking through of who needs to hear it? Who are the key people that need to know about this? Um, so for instance, if we're providing uh, uh, an after-school program for gardening, you know, does Lowe's or Home Depot or some other program know that this is what we're doing? 
so that they feel like, oh, well, we can support you by uh, providing some tools and materials that you might need to help do your gardening program. Or are we sharing it with other people who who are interested in gardening says, oh, so this is where I can support and volunteer and be part of my community by volunteering. So really thinking through who are the key stakeholders? Who are the key people that needs to hear this story? Well, and I would be remiss because I know, you know, Samantha is hiding behind her video right now. And I see, you know, Danae is in the list of participants and we have a great group of folks who are ready to support evaluation and that doesn't just apply. And I don't know if everybody knows this, like that's not just the common measures. The folks that are at the PDTA center at university of Minnesota who support evaluation are evaluators. They've been in the field, they've done the work and they know how to do some things. And they love having conversations about building capacity, about some cool tricks and tools and things that you can do to make evaluation better and easier. Um, and so while they are staffed to help with common measures, they know things. And so they're really great resources that are available to all of our folks who are across the system. So. Shout out for Sam and Danae. Program adaptation. So do you review your evidence base? Do you adapt as needed? Do you adapt to new science? Do you proactively adapt to changes in the environment? I feel like we all did that in the middle of COVID. There was a lot of proactively adapting, maybe a little bit too much proactively adapting for some of us in the middle of COVID. Um, making decisions about what components are ineffective and shouldn't continue because part of sustainability is admitting when something should not be sustained. If something doesn't work, don't do it. It it really is simple. So what's what's my low score on this one, Philip? Reviewing the evidence base. So this one is near and dear to my heart a little bit. You heard me talk about my curriculum team and how that money helps to like update some things. I've seen a lot of programs that need some help, that, that need some updating, that exist in our world. And it's a frustration point for me to see programs that haven't been updated because I sit at a university and we have new science. And when things aren't using that science, then personal opinion, it, it shouldn't be a thing in the world. Like if you're not using the latest science that we have that says we go this way, not that way. I mean, that's to me, that's a no brainer. Um, what are some cool ways that you guys though on this call Revisit your science. For me, I have a lot of nerds on staff. We like reading research. I'm not seeing nothing in my chat, Philip. Uh, Jody put something in. I like what she put. She said that Oh. They uh, do survey results after one year. They review them um, and look at participation. And there we go. So Nancy says the evaluation team provides updates and analyses at team meetings. And they serve, Lindley serves as a reviewer for journals or conferences. That's a great way to stay up on some science. Um, read, write, and review. shameless plug i'm doing a session at na4hydp on reading writing and reviewing with the research and evaluation team so I, I think that's critical is to be in that space what else are y'all just serving as what else y'all doing Attending conferences. I like hanging out with grad students. 
they're constantly doing things like lit reviews and research papers and always talking about things that are new and different. All right, so moving on to communications, Philip. So um, <laughs> you, you already gave it away. Um, the program has communication strategies to secure and maintain public support. And this overlaps a lot with some of the things we've already talked about, the success stories, having good pictures, having good impact stories, having good evaluation data, all of that goes into your communications. Um, program staff communicating the need for the program to the public. So um, do your program staff have an elevator speech for your program? Do they have that 30 second to a minute appeal down pat so they can, if they run into somebody, let's say they run into the mayor in the elevator and the mayor is really curious about what you're doing, can they sell it? Um, program is marketed in a way that generates interest, increases community awareness of the issue and demonstrates value to the public. And I think I saw it was the first one on here, right, Philip? Yeah, so communication strategies, we're back to that public support piece. We're back to that, how are we telling our story outside of ourselves? I feel like I've asked 15 different ways how folks tell their story. So let's go on and move us to our next one, Philip, unless you have something to add about communications. The only thing that I would add with communications is really taking the time to develop a communications plan and really developing who's talking to who within, outside, what what that message is, uh, how often are they going to make sure that they're talking so really developing and fleshing out that communications plan that the entire team understands and knows. I love that. And you made me think about our branding guidelines that we have, like our university has branding guidelines, right? The, which side am I on? My wolf or your, um, I forget what he's called. He's a something lion that Philip has on his shirt. Yeah. Um, but our university does it and it is immediately identified by the community when I walk out in North Carolina that I am wearing black and red instead of blue and white because we are competitive with our UNC system partner at Chapel Hill in North Carolina. Um, but you see the brand behind us, the PDTA Center has a brand that it uses. Those are things that become recognizable and if you do it well and you place it all across the community and you give out flyers, you put it on social media, people start to pick up on that. They start to see it and they recognize it. And if you have the ability to, to put that in front of your stakeholders, I think that really starts to make a difference in recognizability of your program. So, all right, strategic planning. So program plans for future resource needs. So are you thinking right now about sustaining your program? And I don't know if any of like our first years are in here, our, our year one sites, but you should be thinking now about those resource needs in year six of your program. What does that look like? Do you have a long-term financial plan? Do you have a sustainability plan? So notice those are two different things. There's a financial plan and there's a sustainability plan. There's a reason for that. The program's goals are understood by all of the stakeholders and the program clearly outlines roles and responsibilities for all stakeholders. Right, so the program has a long-term financial plan. I can't do a show of hands, can I? I was going to be, show me, like, all of you. Are, um, there's a lot of reactions and things. I don't know. 
what works on here. But if you have a sustainable, you have a long-term financial plan, put it in the chat for me. Just like say yes, or give me a thumbs up or a do something. And Matilda has raised her hand. <coughs> Working on it. Are there examples of these you could share? I don't know. Do we have an example of a long-term financial plan, Philip? That's something we could work on. Oh, she meant thumbs up. So, and, and that's the other reason why we like things like this. Uh, because then that lets us know as a PDTA center how we can best support um, you, the grantees. Um, I will say this, though. We're going to be a little hesitant as far as certain things, um, as far as the planning aspect and, and understanding um, what to do as far as as far as like looking at developing a long term financial plan. Absolutely. We can help uh, put something together for that. But as far as what you put in it, we have to be really careful because that's one of the things that we're told that we cannot do is is, is direct as far as budget and budget concerns. Um, so that's where we're going to be a little cautious about how we talk about it. But as far as thinking through the fact that you need to have a long-term financial plan, absolutely. And some I, some things that should be in, the, in included in that financial plan, again, going back to uh, where are you going to get, uh, what, what are the things that you're going to need to pay for? And where are you going to get the money to pay for? So what what is your plan to receive funds from, whether it's the university, from a community partner, or in-kind funds, or things like that? So absolutely, we can work on putting together some, some tools and resources on that so that we can share that out. When I think a lot that goes into that is what should we sustain? Because if you think about how you're going to fund specific program elements, the things you need to be thinking about more so even than dollars are what are the elements I need to sustain? Because every one of those elements comes probably with a price point or an in-kind point. And I know that, you know, we can, that's a spot where we can have a conversation about be thinking about X, Y, and Z as you go outside of this place. And Philip's right. We are absolutely not allowed to help you with financials specifically, but thinking about programs. That's kind of the thing that we can do. The sustainability plan part, who knows why I said that's a different thing than a long-term financial plan. What's the difference? Yeah, we're going to have a conversation about that, Jody, and see what we can, what we're allowed to do and what we can do and what we can provide. What's the difference, y'all? Sustainability plan, sustainability plan, say that five times fast, or financial plan. That's it. Staff are part of a sustainability plan, but sustainability plans do not necessarily cost money. I have um, a former CIFAR grant that had some elements sustained because we trained teachers how to do some things. And it's still going because we train teachers how to do some things. We're not paying the teachers, but the program is happening. Sustainability plans stand alone after funding. Right. So they're different things. You can sustain program elements if another institution takes it on and you don't have any part of the funding within that. And so you need to think about what are the part, how do you, how do you sustain something even if you don't have dollars? Because sometimes that happens. Sometimes 
extension will pick up a program and keep running it, or sometimes the school system will, or a community organization will. There's there's a lot of different ways that happens. All right, I think we are rolling up on just a few minutes left. And so I think this is a great time to open it up if anybody has questions or any final thoughts that we need to share as a team. So please use the chat to add any questions or the Q&A, we can see both of them. What are your questions that you have for Philip and for Autumn? Thank you, Jody. I'll jump in with the question. They didn't even ask me to do this, but I see we have a number of new grantees, uh, first year grantees on the webinar, which is amazing. Welcome to all of you. Um, for both of you, because you have a long career with CIFAR, do you have any key tips for those first years? Because you're saying start planning first year, but any tips about how to do that or what you've seen has worked really effectively? Communicate often with your team, with your leaders, with your community, with everybody you can think of. Figure out who those folks are who are going to help you sustain and know what they're passionate about, know what their mission statement says, know what they value. Because if you can put your messaging into their language, they're more likely to buy into what you're doing. And that helps long term. And Dr. Martin has asked, uh, Philip, I want you to answer that also, but we have a question in the Q and A also. Yeah. So to to that, I would say definitely, uh, like Autumn said, communicate early, often, always. Um, make sure that you understand that having meetings is not a bad thing. Having meetings that have no purpose is a bad thing, but you need to have meetings that have a purpose, that have an agenda, that have a specific time, that have a goal for why you're having this meeting. You need to have those communications plan in place and use your coach. Um, and to the, the, the question that we have in the Q&A, which is, would it be better served to have an advisory committee from the community, from the community that you are serving? The answer is yes, um, always yes. You want to make sure that, um, like we said, and 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 like you saw in in some of the different um, categories in in the piece that you got to get the community involved. Again, that is part of the name of the CIFAR Sustainable Community Project. You have to get the community involved, and having an advisory committee from the community is absolutely uh, a win. All right, I'm gonna do our closing comments, but if you have some lingering questions, put them in and Autumn and Philip will interrupt me. I wanna thank all of you for joining us for today's webinar. We want to remind you to please take a few moments to complete the online survey. Also, as a reminder for any 2019 grantees, there will be a networking call to discuss transitioning your grants, so more on sustainability. Contact your Cypher coach for more details. Finally, if you'd like more information on this webinar or other topics, we invite you to contact the Cypher PDTA Center via email at cipharpdta at umn.edu. Again, thank you to Autumn and Philip. Thank you all. Thank you.